The final thing we're going to talk about for endocrine is going to be the pancreas in chapter 39. And the pancreas, um, mostly what we're going to cover is diabetes. Um, it's actually a pretty cool subject. You could spend days on it. Um, but we're just going to kind of touch on a lot of different um, medications that are used to treat diabetes as well as what the pancreas does in the body. So the pancreas has clusters of cells called islets of Langerhans. Um, these cells contain alpha, um, alpha cells and beta cells. Alpha cells secrete glucagon. Beta cells secrete insulin and amylin. And these two hormones have the exact opposite job of each other. Insulin breaks down um, sugar for storage, and glucagon releases sugar from storage. So when we have increased blood sugar, we want to increase our insulin that's being secreted by the pancreas and decrease glucagon. So when we have that sugar floating around in the blood after a meal, what we want to do is be able to either use it right away, get it into the cells, or store it in the liver. So when we are in between meals and we have low blood sugar, we increase glucagon. Let's say you are, you know, three, four hours between meals, you're going to go do a workout. Now your body needs energy. So you're going to, your blood sugar is low, glucagon is going to be secreted by the pancreas, and there's not going to be any insulin. So what glucagon does is, again, it causes the liver to release glucose. It breaks down um, glycogen, which is stored, stored glucose molecules, and basically makes it um, into a form that the body can use, which is glucose. So insulin is released throughout the day. Um, it's called a basal release. And then there are spikes when it is mealtime um, or when, you're, when you eat. Insulin goes up. Hopefully that all makes sense. If you guys have any questions, that's covered um, under page 667 into 668. It's hopefully not too complicated. Again, stay at that level. Don't get into all the receptors and whatnot um, because we want to kind of stay away from that amount of information. We just want to get the idea that increase blood sugar, increase insulin, decrease glucagon, decrease blood sugar, the exact opposite happens. So that amylin that we were going to talk about, um, it's secreted along with insulin and basically what it does is it slows down gastric emptying so it allows the food to stick around for a little bit longer. Um, let's see if I can cover the exact, um, I think we covered a little later on when we talk about amylin, um, like peptides. So it works to lower blood sugar, it responds to meals, blah, blah, blah. I don't cover it too much right there. So we're going to get into that in a little while. Um, in addition, besides glucose stimulation, there are hormones called incretin that increase insulin, insulin secretion. GIP, glucose-dependent insulinotropic peptide, and GLP, glucagon-like peptide. Both hormones are secreted by endocrine cells in the stomach, I'm sorry, in the um, small intestine. And what happens is they are stimulated by the presence of glucose. So not within the bloodstream, but directly within the small intestine. So when food enters in and glucose is present, those two hormones will be secreted. They are carried throughout the circulation to pancreatic beta cells, where they cause more insulin to be secreted than is already being secreted. They also stop the liver from producing glucose. Eventually, the incretins, GLP-1 and GIP, are inactivated by DPP-4. Now, the reason I'm telling you all these names is because at um, a point in the future, we are going to talk about um, different parts of this pathway that we can inhibit to prevent um, high blood sugar. So basically to kind of bring the blood sugar back down, which as you know, in type 2 diabetics, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of insulin resistance. And in type 1 diabetics, there's no insulin. So anything we can do along this pathway to sort of help the body break down glucose or store glucose um, is going to be beneficial. So moving on, we are on to glucagon. So what does that do? We talked a little bit about how glucagon um, causes energy to be released from the liver. Basically, it's breaking down glycogen. And a lot of these words sound familiar, so um, or sound similar. So kind of try to separate them out. Glycogen is stored glucose. Glucagon breaks down glycogen, allows it to be released from the liver in the form of glucose. That's what we can use in our brains. That's what we can use in our bodies. or glucagon is secreted in times where there is low blood sugar and the body has a demand for energy. Usually in between meals is when we see it um, increase often. Glucagon is available as a medication and it's used to treat hypoglycemia in patients who are insulin dependent. Um, so in patients who are insulin dependent, the insulin can force their blood sugar too low. So if we have a patient that is unconscious and hypoglycemic, 
we can't give them something by mouth to bring their blood sugar up, so we'll give them an injection into their muscle, and that breaks down um, glycogen into glucose, and all of a sudden their blood sugar will rise. Sort of an emergency response medication. So moving on to diabetes, the process of diabetes. We have two types. Um, type 1 diabetes is uh, patients who whose pancreas can no longer make insulin, and this may happen very early on in childhood. Usually, most of the people who have type 1 diabetic diabetes were diagnosed in childhood. 10% of all diabetics are type 1. The rest of them, the majority, are type 2. Type 2 diabetics secrete insulin, but over time, due to poor eating habits, not exercising, family history of diabetes, um, they are more resistant to that insulin, so it requires more and more and more insulin to reach the same effect. In addition, because there's so much insulin around, the body can't make receptors quick enough to keep up with the amount of insulin and actually downregulates the receptors um, that are available for insulin to bind to to get glucose into cells. So we have two processes at work there that are causing someone's blood sugar to rise. Insulin resistance, downregulation of receptors. Um, the difference between the two, type 1 is autoimmune. It's basically the body has attacked itself and sort of destroyed those cells in the pancreas. Um, these patients are always insulin dependent. Because they don't make their own insulin, we have to replace it. Type 2 diabetes can be treated with a combination of better diet, exercise, and then oral medications. These patients may also take insulin later on in their disease. However, um, they are not insulin dependent necessarily right off the bat. Okay, what else can I tell you about that? So the end effects of diabetes. Um, you know, when you think about high blood sugar, you think, whoa, what's the worst that's going to happen? I'm either going to have high blood sugar and feel crappy, um, such as, you know, fatigue, headache, um, and eventually you can deal, go into a diabetic coma if your blood sugar is too high. Diabetic ketoacidosis is the term for that. Um, or I can have hypoglycemia and be um, confused, um, possibly fall, blah, blah, blah. So what happens if we control our blood sugar but don't necessarily control it as well as we should? It's not in that level that's going to put us into a coma on either side. However, it's still high to where it's actually damaging organs such as your kidney, your blood vessels, um, your eyes. There's a number of things that diabetics later on in life will suffer as a, as a result of their disease. So. Think of it this way, increased blood sugar damages our blood vessels, and our blood vessels are everywhere. Um, so that's why our kidneys get damaged. You know, it sometimes affects our renal function, which as we discussed is very important to getting rid of medications and processing stuff in the body. So um, it can damage our vision and cause um, vision problems later on in life for patients. It can also cause neuropathy, which again, blood vessels go all the way to the tips of our fingers. When there's not adequate blood flow, we can develop neuropathy, which is that pain or like a tingling in the end of our fingers and toes, and we sort of lose the sensation as diabetics. In addition, it can cause diabetic foot infections. Um, if blood flow to the feet is poor, you can't see your feet necessarily every single day, especially diabetics who are overweight. They might not, you might not be able to look at the bottom of their feet and say, oh my goodness, I have an infection, and they can't feel it because they've lost sensation. So they can develop infections that actually require removal of toes, removal of actual feet, limbs. It can go all the way up to the knee. It's, it can get pretty bad depending on the situation. So this is why we want to keep our blood sugar in a very tight range of control. Um, I believe those numbers are covered in here. Um, it is going to differ for various patients. So. Generally, you want your blood sugar to be somewhere between 80 and um, 130. I believe in the numbers off the top of my head that I'm coming up with. Most normal people are right around 100 most of the time. You know, it shoots up after a meal and goes back down um, when the meal has been digested. So we give medications to these patients to keep them in that tight range of control. Um, symptoms of diabetes or increased blood glucose include, especially undiagnosed, dehydration, thirst, excessive hunger, use of fat and protein as a source of energy, which is where we end up with ketones in blood. When the body's breaking down proteins as a source of energy, we end up with ketones in our blood, which is called ketosis. As it gets worse, it becomes metabolic acidosis, which is also referred to as ketoacidosis. One of the big problems with diabetics whose blood sugar rises too high is called DKA, and that's diabetic ketoacidosis. And that's where they're 
borderline sending themselves into a health crisis because their blood sugar is really high, their body's starting to shut down because it can't handle it. Um, <clears throat> CNS, depression, coma, and death can occur. So we get these patients right into the hospital and we start treating them um, with insulin and with potassium because insulin causes a loss of potassium. We hydrate them and we just basically support them until their blood sugar is back down to a normal range. Uh, we talked about long-term failure to regulate blood glucose. Um, <clears throat> And again, we, we monitor that blood glucose by um, what's called point of care testing in a hospital, or a patient might have their own monitor at home. They prick their finger, take a sample of blood, and the machine tells them exactly what their blood sugar is. So that's short-term monitoring. That tells you at that point in time, what is their blood sugar? Over time, the doctor wants to see where their blood sugar has gone over time, like has it been, you know, super high most of the time, super low. So patients will keep monitor or records of their uh, monitoring. And in addition, the doctor can draw a level called an A1C. And what that is, it's um, basically it tells the doctor the average uh, average blood glucose control. So normally they want to see that between uh, below 6% um, for most diabetic patients. You and I, if we didn't have diabetes, would definitely be, low, be below 6% because our body can regulate its blood sugar. Anything above 6 or 7%, we're starting to worry that they're not getting tight enough sugar control. We worry about end organ damage, and then we want to maybe adjust their medications to help them manage their diabetes a little better. So there are several different types of injectable medications we're going to cover right off the bat. Um, and this is in addition for all diabetics, tight diet control and exercise if possible. So the injectables are insulin, amylin analogs, and incretin mimetics. Let's start off with insulin, which is pretty straightforward. Used by type 1 or type 2 diabetics, it can be injected, um, usually it's injected sub-Q. However, in emergencies, it can be given IV, as well as IM if needed, but we try to avoid those routes. So, because we, we mostly want the patients to be able to inject themselves and be comfortable with that and maintain that control. Emergencies would include um, hyperglycemia, where they end up in a hospital, or hypoglycemia, where they become unresponsive. So insulin historically came from pigs. That's, that was the source of insulin for a very long time. Now we synthesize it. It's synthetic, made in a lab. It's a lot more predictable and um, a lot less allergic reactions because it's not coming from a foreign animal. Doses are always individualized. Most people aren't on the same dose. They start off with a, about where they think the patient's going to need to be. And what they'll do is titrate up until they've got that blood sugar controlled right where they want to be. There's three different types short acting, intermediate acting, and long acting. Um, most patients when they start insulin are almost always on a short acting dose given with meals. Over time, once we figure out that they need to be controlled at what's called, we talked about a basal rate, especially if their body's not producing insulin, we'll give them a long acting insulin, usually at night or in the morning before their meal. And what that does is it keeps it allows insulin to stick along, stick around throughout the day. We're going to start here, we're going to give that dose, it's going to go, 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 and then slowly drop off by the time we've given the next dose. So there's no lag time, there's no up and down, there's no peaks and valleys. It's just a constant source of insulin for the patient at all times. In addition to that, they might also be on the mealtime injection. So potency is expressed in units, um, and there are special syringes to measure the amount of um, medication that the diabetic will need to inject, usually injected subcutaneously either in the arm or the stomach. Most diabetics stick with the stomach because it's a place that can be covered up um, by our clothing. So over time with multiple injections, um, you can sort of what's called um, atrophy that site. And what happens is basically the skin just breaks down um, and it becomes sort of dimply. So that's why we want them to rotate sites constantly. Insulin, short-acting insulins are available for over-the-counter purchase, and that's to make insulin easy to access for patients who might have run out or forgotten their insulin, especially at home. Um, they are kept behind the counter in the pharmacy because they do have to be refrigerated. Once insulin is out of the fridge, it is good for 28 days, but we encourage patients to keep their insulin in the fridge whenever possible to maintain the um, integrity of that medication. So we're going to switch over to another video because we're just about at our 15-minute time limit. Please hold.